we will shortly be starting the webinar session. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes for people to join. We'll be back with you again shortly. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for taking the time to join our webinar on how to deliver a better hygiene experience. In just a minute, I will hand over to two of our technical experts, Dr. Cole Moore and Jamie Woodle, who will share with you hygiene expertise that is taken from real life experience as a service provider with over 100 years of experience. We hope that you will learn a lot from this webinar, but if you have any burning questions at the end of the session, then we'll be finishing with a Q&A. Now, without further ado, please let me hand over to Dr. Colm Moore. Thanks, Katie. Um, that's terrific. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I think we'll just click on, I think with this. So we've got uh, our learning outcomes for today. Um, so what is coronavirus just in, in general? I'm not gonna go into too much detail. There's <laughs> over 4,000 papers written on that one. Um, but it's more about really reducing the risk. We want to try and uh, get into people's heads. How in God's name do I tackle this and how do I reduce the risk of actually contracting this uh, in my workplace? Um, uh, the identification of the hygiene hotspots, very, very important. And then um, because, as I said, there's so much noise out there uh, in terms of um, social media um, and also now uh, there's so much, um, there's so much scientific papers out there, but a lot of them are non-peer reviewed. So there's some absolute rubbish out there as well. So it's kind of one step up from Facebook, uh, if I'm brutally honest. So it's cutting through the noise um, as best we can. Hats, we'll introduce you to a little, uh, some tools that we have that created based on uh, risk reduction, and then uh, just basically how we can help. And then a summary, we'll have some questions and answers at the end, okay? So coronavirus, um, if you just flick on actually, Katie, that's, yeah. Um, so this, the disease is, is um, COVID-19. The actual virus is a coronavirus. So there's many, many types. There's four main types of coronavirus that we come across and we have in the past. Um, this one, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is, is particularly nasty because of the, the mortality rate that is associated with it. Um, and as you can see there, there's 33 million known cases throughout the world and we're just tipping on a million, and that's just coming from the WHO's website, um, which is, it's just absolutely shocking um, as to, you know, the impact of this so far. Um, and in the UK, we've, we're approaching half a million cases, um, and, and also we're approaching, knocking on the door of 42,000 deaths, which is incredibly unfortunate. Um, so if I flick on then, what we're trying to get across here is, this is a concept that, that, that not everybody gets. Um, and once you get this concept of breaking the chain, it then things start to fall into place. You go, ah, right, now, now I can understand what, how, to, how do I go about trying to control this thing in my workplace or in my home or in my school or whatever you're, you're situated. So you start, it starts with, transmission starts with a pathogen. 
Um, and then you need a reservoir. Now, the reservoir, by, by the truest definition, is the organism or where it started, where it began. So there's many, many researchers are going out looking for um, sources of, of this virus within bats and maybe pangolins. So they don't know where it started. But if we look at our businesses or even our own personal offices, the a reservoir somewhere where you've got a, a, a high concentration of this potentially, somewhere where it's difficult to control because there's so much traffic, transient people going to and from. Um, so if you've got a, an infected individual going into a toilet, they sneeze, they cough, and they touch, everything then becomes cross-contaminated, and then the next person goes in, it's, uh, uh, then they can get um, contaminated, and they can pick up the disease. Then it's down to the mode of transmission. So we've, we've got two modes that we know of, um, and when this all kicked off, it was very much um, in the touch zone. So you've got direct and indirect transmission. So direct is when, if I have COVID, I, I then sneeze on, on Jamie, who's next to me there, um, a couple of thousand miles away. And um, I, I will sneeze on him and he will then contract that because he will inhale that uh, through, his, through his mouth or, or he it might go through his eyes or through his nose. And that's a direct transmission. An indirect tr transmission would be one where I would, I would sneeze on a surface and then Jamie would come along and, and touch that surface and then subsequently touch his nose, mouth, ears, etc., uh, his eyes, the mucous membranes. And then he would, he would potentially contract if the, the viral load was high enough. And then, of course, a susceptible host. So somebody, the emergence in the information now that we're getting is, is that the um, people who, have, uh, immuno, who are immunosuppressed or, or can't, can't produce immunoglobulin are actually more susceptible. And that happens to occur in, in, in people who are more elderly, but also uh, throughout the population where we, people don't know that they're, they're, uh, they have a weaker immune system. So that's all emerging. So a susceptible host, somebody who is, is prone to it, um, you know, that will carry on the infection and then start to sneeze it out. So that's, that's, the, that's the cycle of it. So pathogen reservoir, a mode of transmission and a susceptible host. Where we come across or what we have to try and do and get our heads around is then put in controls that will help reduce all this. So it's washing your hands, cleaning. It's, it's stop handshaking. I haven't shaken anybody's hand in, in well, since March. Um, it's covering your, 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 um, your, your, mouth, your mouth when you're sneezing and your nose when you're sneezing. So my children came in in March um, completely, uh, I didn't tell them to, 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 to display cough etiquette, but they were doing it because they were taught in school. So it's very, very simple things and simple measures to try and reduce the spread of this. Um, avoid contact and, and then also the social distancing. And what was really clever, I thought, in the UK, if, if everybody adhered to this, is the hands, face and space. Those three elements will greatly, if you adhere to those, those three elements will greatly reduce this. Um, coronavirus and greatly reduce the pandemic. We're into a second wave, as they say now. So it's hand space and face and space. So it's it's about identifying the hotspot. So we're we're in this. This is what we do. This is our space. Uh, we're in the hygiene um, business, and we know that from from previous studies that we've done is we know where the hotspots are for this um, indirect transmission. Um, we know, and we've done many, many, many studies that will show you that, uh, you know, that's a dirty spot. Now, we're not saying that we're, we're screening for coronavirus, but what we have done is, is we've screened for uh, levels of dirt or ATP, which is assumptive for bacteria, so it's a living cell. So what we're doing, we, we, we've got a picture in a building and we know what that picture looks like. So we know if in the event of something happening, we know where to, to go and clean. If if we're trying to do preventative cleaning, we know where the hotspots would be. So that's where you want to focus your, your cleaning regimes on. And of course, then as a result of that, on top of that, we have knowledge and expertise within building systems and our property services. So we, we know about you know, central heating, we know about um, HVAC systems, et cetera. And culminating from that is, is a risk-based approach to to, uh, to controlling this when we, when we approach a business, uh, a, a building or an office. Um, other, other studies that we've done is, is more sort of gives us an insight into the behaviour of, of individuals. So if you click on there, Katie, so 62% of people think 
more should be done to prevent washrooms from becoming a place where coronavirus spreads. So it's in the psyche, people. This is a, a behavioural study that we did, and it tells us that people intuitively know that a washroom is a hotspot. And then 51% of people think that they, they could be exposed um, to coronavirus in a public washroom. And, and again, this, this backs up what, what we know. It is, a, it is a pretty dirty place, potentially, if it's not tackled correctly and if you don't put in the right controls. OK, some of the um, cutting through the noise then. Um, so we, we, we hear this on social media. People ask us and uh, genuinely uh, out of just interest. Um, so if you just take that first one, someone told me that their disinfectants can remain active for weeks or even months on a surface. Now, this is sheer nonsense. Um, there's two things going on here. So there's some products that may have been tested um, against bacteria, for example. But you cannot extrapolate the, the, the length of time that that means that it would work against a virus, for example. It's a different organism completely. Um, the second thing is it advocates really, really poor hygiene practices. The proper hygiene practice would be to wash your hands first and then disinfect and then dry them. That's the best practice. That's uh, there's no going away from that. There's uh, any any health practitioner will tell you that. Any um, infection control person will tell you that it's wash and then then disinfect. And that's sanitising. Um, the uh, the other one there is well, I I don't need to wash my hands if I use hand sanitizer. So hand sanitizer is is fine you you know soap and water is 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 good it's it's very very good hand sanitizer is very good but i still would go on to my previous point is your best practice would be to clean first then sanitize in the event that and in many cases you cannot there's no there's no facility there's no washroom facility there's no water uh, available absolutely i would advocate disinfecting using a sanitizer but the best practice would be to wash and then sanitize I bought 200 face masks for my staff. Are they suitable? Ooh, that's, uh, how long is a piece of string? It's really, what are you looking to achieve? There's such a, an array of, of face masks, or we say face coverings, all the way up to you know, um, disposables or reusable uh, or PE respiratory protective equipment. So really, you'd ask yourself, well, am I trying to stop transmission to individuals, or am I trying to stop transmission from. So it, it really all depends, or are you trying to do both? And that would direct what kind of uh, face covering you're going to select for your staff. So if you take a scarf or a, just an ordinary cloth mask, you might be able to filter out maybe 50% of the, of the particulates um, that are coming from you. So you're protecting the, uh, the people around you. To some degree. Now, there's there's emerging research coming to say, well, actually, a cloth covering might even break it up into smaller smaller bits. Um, but again, I'll 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 park that because they have to try and elucidate exactly what is happening there because they don't know whether it's transmitting smaller droplets uh, of virus or not. But notwithstanding, you will you will reduce the viral load. Absolutely, will re reduce the viral load. What percentage that is, it's on. You know, you don't know because it's different, different levels of cloth and different thickness, etc. Then you're into a, a different type of, of of mask covering. So you've got a surgical mask, so it's what we know we, we call a, a fluid resistant surgical mask, and that will give you one way protection. Um, and, and it, it also, it, you know, it gives you a good level of protection from from particulates and. It's, it's protecting people uh, uh, in the environment. Then in the UK, we have uh, an FFP1, a P2, and a P3, three levels of, of um, respirator, as we call it. And an FFP1 will give you about 80% protection against particulates. Uh, a P2 is 94, and a P3 is in the region of 99.95%. Of course, things like this, my beard, would affect that. Uh, things like uh, fitting it to your nose and around your mouth and getting a good covering will obviously reduce that uh, considerably. So when we ask a question, you know, I bought 200 face masks, I, it, it, there is no answer until you actually, um, the, until you actually apply to what your particular situation is and who, who should be wearing them and why. 
all cleaning chemicals are the same. Um, I can use anything and it will still be effective. Well, it, not necessarily because cleaning cleaning will will absolutely reduce the virus. Um, there's no doubt about it. But cleaning products are cleaning products, and then you've got disinfecting products, which are disinfecting products, um, and you've got some that do both. Um, so, but your cleaning product, you you again, you need to be sure that it's it's not going to damage the surface. Um, the disinfecting products, you also want to check to see if uh, if you're let's say you're disinfecting against something like coronavirus, you absolutely want to make as sure as a minimum that it has EN one four four seven six um, on the on the label. So read the label. That that means that it's gone through a minimum standard of testing against um, reference viruses, not coronavirus necessarily, but reference viruses that um, are uh, non-enveloped. And they, they also will, it'll be a log four reduction as a minimum for five minutes on a surface. So, so keep an eye out for those, um, but also, you know, apply COSH as well, because you're, if there, there might be additives or, or adjutants in, in, within the, the chemical that, um, that might affect uh, something else that you're using it on. Um, so just be just be careful of, of the product that you're using. 99% as well, that might sound really, really cool uh, in terms of killing stuff, but if you've got a million viruses, which could very easily be if somebody is shedding shedding viruses, um, that only means that you've got, you know, potentially 10,000 left. So 99% is, is, looks good, but it ain't, it ain't that good. Uh, so really what you want to be looking for is, is uh, log 6, which is 99.9999%, uh, which will leave you, render one virus left out of a million. Um, and that's why I'd also further emphasize the cleaning process is really important to get rid of a lot of this, um, the virus and the organic matter, and then you then disinfect and you're sort of um, finishing it off, as it were. So it's a combination of those two that are really, really important. So. How do you eat an elephant? Because this, you know, you're faced with all this and you're going like, my God, am I going to go back to work? What protocols do I need to use? Well, it's bit by bit is, is really is the, is the way you do this. And what we're going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Jamie to go through HATS, which is a little tool that we've devised from our expertise, which brings you through the elements. If you apply these four simple principles to every stage of your journey through your, through your office, um, you will actually come up with a very logical uh, control procedure that will actually reduce this um, this virus. So, Jamie. Thank you, Dr. Moore, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, as Colin mentioned there, we're going to look at a tool that we use called HATS, and this is the way that we break down that elephant, um, break down any workplace in front of us into small manageable chunks, so we can then introduce some of these controls that you saw earlier to help break that chain of infection. So, looking at the HATS model, we start with H, hygiene, we've then got A, atmosphere, um, we've got T for touch, and then we've got S, social distancing. Katie, if you want to move on. So let's take the first one of these, hygiene. So hand hygiene, and really we're talking about hand hygiene, um, we'll talk about hygiene in general for this, this model, it should be an ethos in any workplace. And while in food preparation establishments, for instance, um, that might have been part of everyday life uh, six, 12 months ago, the global pandemic has ensured that hand hygiene has firmly been raised up in terms of its importance. Let's start with a couple of take home figures. So according to a survey, only 67% of the general public wash their hands on leaving a washroom. And of that, only 16% do that correctly. Now, when we consider that um, four fifths of all communicable diseases are transmitted by touch, that's really quite astounding. But there is a caveat in that those figures are from before uh, coronavirus really became um, a thing this year. Now, within a workplace, employees have a responsibility to ensure they're regularly washing their hands and avoid touching their face, particularly at key points in the day. And business owners and managers should support this by ensuring adequate time is um, provided to make sure that you can wash your hands correctly. It's also really important to make sure that as an employer um, that you provide uh, your washrooms with a good supply of good quality soap, 
sanitizer, um, hand drying facilities, and that outside of the washroom, employees are never having to search out for sanitizer, tissues, bins, etc. A good principle to employ here when it comes to hygiene is I need it now. So no one should be um, needing to walk any particular distance to find the things that they need to employ good levels of hygiene. So sanitizers, soaps, hand drying facilities, um, but also things like tissues and also things like uh, waste bins to actually capture used uh, tissues. If you're promoting a catch a kill it bin it principle, particularly as we come into flu season and cold season, um, you should have ample supply of all the things you need throughout. This is easily done by just running through a normal day or route within the building and jotting down key areas where you require things like tissues, hand sanitizers. Make sure that hand, uh, sanitizers are positioned by doorways. Um, make sure that your washrooms have um, sanitizers, particularly outside. So the last thing that you do on leaving a washroom is have a hand sanitizer available to sanitize your hands. Um, and make sure that obviously all those things are never empty. And then as part of this, it's also important to consider how you reiterate this message um, throughout your workplace on a regular basis. And we'll look at some of the ways that we can do that in a second. So when it comes to actually washing our hands, um, it's something that up to 62% of men and 40% of women um, don't do. And one of the small silver linings of the pandemic is that we are now, hopefully, uh, we're far more tuned in to the need to wash our hands more regularly and more thoroughly. Um, certainly the, the tune of happy birthday being sung twice over to, to that 20 to 30 second rule in people's minds is something that's um, a standout moment um, for me for the last few months. It's a real good way of emphasising, particularly to children, but to anyone really, um, how long 20 seconds is and how long we should be washing our hands. Hand washing should be carried out using warm running water, and plenty of good quality soap, and then importantly, we should also be drying our hands um, using um, good quality hand dryers or uh, paper towels. Now, whilst like it is for many of us, we will continue to work from home for some time. As and when we do return to the office, it's vital that we feel safe and reassured by the measures in place. And taking steps to prepare buildings now um, will help to do so in an uncertain climate. It will help reassure employees um, about coming back into a building and also anyone that's working in, a, in, a, in a, an office building or workplace right now, it's that continual reassurance that things are being done and um, measures are being taken to, to keep people safe and hygienic. If we look then at some of the products that are available, um, we take hand sanitizers for example, Colm spoke earlier about the need to make sure that we've got suitable products in a washroom. That EN number that tells you that it's been independently tested um, is very important because that's the thing that's, uh, that stands out to say, okay, this product is suitable for a particular pathogen and it's been tested to make sure it's effective against it. And again, just to reiterate that 99% might seem quite effective, but in reality, 99.9999% is a lot more effective. We provide hand sanitizers in both an alcohol and a non-alcohol based formulation um, to suit different customer needs and requirements. Um, and all our sanitizers are independently tested and have that EN testing. If we also look at the dispensers that you use, one of the key things when it comes to dispensers for hand sanitizers and surface sanitizers is making sure that they're available, as I said before, in the key points throughout your building. And that can be mapped out by walking around the building and um, marking on those places where you interact with surfaces on a regular basis. Um, or where you're going to get a lot of people accumulating in one area and gathering in one area. It's also important to make sure that the dispensers themselves don't become a, a key touch point. So it's, um, it's a good idea to look for no touch or automatic dispensers uh, where possible. And finally, for this part, the, the same applies when it comes to surface disinfectants. Um, make sure that you're using a good, reliable, um, and proven effective surface disinfectant, um, but also that you've got waste facilities available if you're wiping a surface down to capture anything that's been used, be it a wipe, paper towel, um, and contain that for safe disposal. Katie, if you could click on one. Thank you. 
one final part when it comes to sanitizers um in most places it's it's a good idea to have a number of dispensers to make sure that they're available and they're easily within reach however some buildings some workplaces um, can provide a challenge where you need to get a lot of people through a small area and you've potentially got a bit of a bottleneck um, and obviously with social distancing measures now that can that can prove a challenge one thing to consider in those areas is the actual type of dispenser that you use to make hand sanitizer available. So places like reception areas and buildings where you might have high traffic, high footfall through one particular area. Um, a solution such as this one, the, the rapid sanitizer dispenser, this can deliver up to 10,000 activations um, on the one refill, and then it's got capacity for another 10,000 to be stored within there. Um, but the real beauty of something like this is it can deliver up to one activation per second and that just reduces that congestion and means you can get people flowing through one area um, quite well uh, while still making sure that they're sanitising their hands and remaining hygienic. If we look at the second letter in our HATS acronym, it's A for atmosphere um, or aerosol. So when we talk about the atmosphere, we're talking about airborne um, particular airborne dropul uh, droplets, and that's the aerosol part of our, um, our model here. So the presence of airborne pathogens in the atmosphere, it is of ever increasing relevance, and air quality was a key consideration, a growing uh, consideration, even before the pandemic. More and more buildings, particularly in urban areas, are prioritising air quality and well-being. And both the WHO and the CDC both agree that airborne transmission of coronavirus is possible when in close proximity to an infected person. And you'll be familiar with ever increasing measures and introduction of face coverings and face masks, as Colin spoke about earlier. And that's the reason for that, as we um, as we learn more about the disease, we learn more about the virus. Um, we, the, the need to actually introduce controls like that on an ever-increasing basis is absolutely key. So when it comes to the atmosphere in a workplace, the latest scientific advice is to ventilate rooms thoroughly, uh, where practical um, to do so, by opening doors and windows. And obviously that's taken into account things like the weather, uh, security. Uh, but where it is practical to do so, it's important to ventilate rooms and get fresh air flowing through a room. A single air change, so um, the air in a room being completely replaced by um, fresh air, is estimated to remove 63% of airborne pathogens. So doing that as much as you can, for instance, in 15 to 20 minute um, periods during the course of the day, can help remove those airborne pathogens and make it a more healthy environment. As well as that, the use of well-maintained air handling systems uh, and um, HVAC systems it's, that's recommended to, to continue to be used. Um, the key with that is any air handling system should be well maintained uh, to make sure the filters are in good working condition and they don't actually become uh, a means of spreading around air that isn't uh, of, of, of good quality. And just finally on the A for um, atmosphere in our HATS model, um, within the washroom environment itself, it's also important to consider um, how we go about dry, uh, drying our hands and current advice is that you should use uh, paper towels or a good quality hand dryer. Uh, the one in the image there, this is our pebble unit and that uses um, a HEPA-14 filter. When we talk about filters in a hand dryer, um, anything that's HEPA-13 and above is typically found in a clinical environment, places like hospitals, surgeries, uh, places like that, and that's to do with the, the ability to remove a greater level of airborne particulate or droplets. So by looking for a good quality HEPA filter in a um, uh, hand dryer, you're going some way to, to making sure that airborne pathogens are removed in the washroom. The third part of our touch points. So a touch point um, in this context, anything that is a shared surface, which is likely to be touched by multiple people, interacted with by uh, multiple people. And in most buildings, there will be hundreds, if not thousands of shared common touch points. And these are the hotspots that we referred to before, um, where you can get um, where you can get secondhand transmission of the virus. Somebody touches the surface or somebody sneezes onto a surface and we interact with it. Uh, where unwittingly then picking up 
um, a viral load. So breaking down any work environment and figuring out where those key touch points exist can be quite a challenge. Um, we'd recommend at the start of that process, if, you, if you're looking to uh, implement a risk assessment in a workplace, walk the routes, map out where those common touch points are based on what you interact with as you go. And physically map them out on a site plan or make a list of those touch points as you go. Next, work out the frequency for cleaning each of those. So there needs to be a practical element to this. Um, high risk areas, things like door handles, banisters, um, buttons in lifts if they're used on a regular basis, they will be touched um, multiple times every day. So cleaning frequencies in those areas really need to be quite high. Whereas there'll be other areas which are still uh, common touch points, but won't be interacted with on such um, a frequent basis. And they might be um, suitable to be cleaned maybe two or three times a day, daily. It all comes down to what the actual environment has in it. And that's part of your risk assessment in any workplace. The principle that I mentioned previously, though, this need, uh, I need it now basis um, applies just as much with surface disinfection. So in any workspace, um, it's really important that sanitizers, surface sanitizers, um, and the means to apply them are available. And that can be the same model that you have for hand sanitizers. We see a lot of buildings where you've got hand sanitizers almost every few feet, and that's brilliant to make sure that people can sanitize their hands effectively. But it's also really important to have surface sanitizers available um, throughout a building to make sure that if there's a need to, you can sanitize the surface very quickly. The same applies with things like feminine hygiene units in washrooms and uh, continual service should be maintained with those. Um, but just sticking with the, the surface sanitization side of this, sorry, surface disinfection side of this, um, final point with that for me is to make sure that the right method is used. So Colin spoke earlier about using a good quality disinfectant. Um, what we would suggest is always making sure that it's applied to a clean surface. The chemicals that you're uh, you, uh, using a, in the workplace, a disinfectant will only be effective on a relatively clean surface. It's not going to penetrate through grime, dirt, anything like that on there. But it will destroy the microbes that it's intended to once it's applied. So it's a three-step principle to making sure that surfaces are correctly sanitized. You clean it, then you apply the disinfectant, and then you leave it to dry. And we call that process sanitization. And that's how to effectively reduce microbial load on a surface. The final part of our HATS acronym is social distancing, S. Um, and this can be a um, quite a tricky one to implement in any environment. Human beings, we're naturally gregarious, we're social creatures. Keeping us apart can be quite difficult. But there are some quick wins to be had when it comes to guiding staff and colleagues around a building in a safe manner, uh, while still keeping that two metres apart. So wherever possible, use the building's natural structure, use the natural flow in a building uh, to separate people and so almost subconsciously guide traffic flow around your building to keep, uh, keep people apart by a minimum distance. And having schedules um, in place, that again can help. Um, things like staggering break times, uh, lunch breaks, uh, controls over entry and exit times in certain parts of a building. These are all things that can be implemented locally and can all have a, a very positive effect on maintaining social distancing. Um, in many areas, these measures aren't always practical, um, but also sometimes visual reminders can be important there too. So things like posters, things like floor matting can be a great benefit. Um, a, a large um, floor mat that actually shows you what two metres apart looks like um, it's, it, that can be a great benefit to making sure we're constantly reinforcing this message of hands, face, and then space. Okay. So hopefully that's explained how we break down what at first glance is quite a daunting task into bite-sized chunks using this HATS model. Um, and it's something that we use whenever we attend a site to help us risk assess the site and provide recommendations uh, based on best practice, based on industry experience. But it's also the same model that you can implement your own control strategies um, in your place of work as well. Now, of course, if you would like this doing for you, we can attend your premises and use the HATS model to, to survey your site 
and we do that completely free of charge um, and we can then use that to provide you with guidance and recommendations about how you can then make your workplace um, more safe, more hygienic. To help with these measures that we've discussed, we've launched a comprehensive range of products. Um, I mentioned just a little while ago about these visual reminders, visual cues um, about social distancing, for instance. And we have a range of posters and signage um, that can be used around a site to remind staff and visitors. Uh, and for all attendees on the webinar today, if you would like a free poster, uh, we can send one out to you over the next few days. Now, on the same lines, you heard Colin talk earlier about the need to cut through the noise. Um, one of the, the common questions we get is around PPE, for instance, um, and also about the chemicals that we use. Uh, never has it been more relevant um, and also quite difficult to navigate through all the misinformation out there. And one of the things Dr. Moore discussed concerned PPE and masks. And to help make sourcing the right PPE easier, we've launched a range of high quality fit for purpose PPE items, um, as well as several other um, must haves through our dedicated online web shop, which is available to access uh, by the initial.co.uk website. Um, and a range of supplies and consumables can be found there all of which have been evaluated and checked to ensure they meet the required standards. So, um, in summary, we've explained how virus transmission can occur in buildings. And importantly, you heard Colin talk about how to break that infection chain uh, using proven methods and products from reliable uh, and trusted sources. Um, he spoke about the importance of cutting through the noise of misinformation and basing your hygiene strategy on facts and science. Um, and then I've explained how we use this HATS model to implement our control measures and how you can do the same in your place of work uh, within your budget to protect your staff and visitors. And then finally, we looked at how initial washrooms can help at every stage of that process uh, through informative surveys, right through to providing the correct products for your building so you can be sure you're using a trusted provider. And that brings our webinar to a close. Um, thank you very much for attending today. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, hopefully it has been of use uh, to you and your businesses. Um, and I will now hand back to Katie to field any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much, Colm and Jamie. Um, now, if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to ask them. If you don't know how to, then it's the fourth icon down um, on the right hand side of your screen. It's a, a speech bubble with a question mark in it. Um, and if you type your questions in there, they will come through to me and I can put them to Colm and Jamie. So I've had a couple of questions in already. Um, so one question is, um, what are the key touch points to consider in an office environment? And how often should our cleaning staff be disinfecting them? Um, I'll take this one. So as, as far as the, the key touch points go in an office environment, um, I, would, I would always advocate using that same principle that I spoke about earlier. Um, it's a real good idea to try and visualize that by walking the route through an office space, literally from the, the point you actually enter the building through to where somebody would sit down using the different um, facilities um, and then leaving at the end of the day. And, by mapping it out, you can identify those key touch points. Now, there's going to be some, some relatively uh, obvious ones in there. So, for instance, um, any security features, such as a keypad to get into a building. Um, if you're interacting with stairs, so the banisters, buttons on lifts, um, door handles, prime examples. And they're all things that everybody in the building or most people in the building will be interacting with on a very regular basis. So they're one of the things to really start looking at cleaning um, very frequently throughout the course of the day. Uh, things that are perhaps a little bit further down that list, not in terms of um, the importance, but how often you may need to clean them, uh, maybe things like uh, the personal effects on your desk, because that's something that really there's just going to be yourself interacting with um, during the course of the day. And that could be something that could be picked up maybe uh, once or twice a day when it comes to cleaning. And if I may add as well, it, it's also important to note that having that checklist uh, in advance also helps you if, in the event of an emergency. So if you, if you have a case in your office, then you know where to trace back. 
and, and say, right, well, I'm going to the, the desk is my my high, top priority, and then you trace back through that journey of where that individual was and 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 habited during his or her daily daily work. So very very important to have that. Great, thank you. Um, a few more questions. Someone has just mentioned that they've had a bit of an unstable um, internet connection, so they want to know if there's going to be a recording afterwards. Um, yeah, please rest assured, we, you will be getting a thank you email from us tomorrow. It will have um, the recording attached, um, and also I can, um, if you want to email me as well, I can send you the, the posters that, that Jamie mentioned. So, so yes, this, this will be made available to you afterwards. Um, another question in, um, when I use the washroom in our office building, and that washroom is shared um, apparently with a number of other offices, should I wear a face covering? The, um, uh, me personally, I, I would absolutely wear a face covering because there are situations where, you know, the advice around face coverings is to protect yourself and, and others. And when you're, when you're in a, uh, let's say, a confined space, um you are you are inadvertently put within a, a, a social or within that social distance acceptable social distance uh distance space so you're too close basically so if you're if you're in the supermarket you wear a face covering and people who come close to me i get i get irritated because i'm gonna you know keep your distance so in a in a loo in a washroom you are you are probably going to be forced into a space that is is uh, not acceptable so i would wear a, a face mask for the want of wearing a face covering it's not a big deal i would say yes thank you colm um someone has also said um they're an office manager um they just don't know where to start well okay I, i'd always I, i'd always start at the beginning and and this is why we we sort of we have this tool, the HATS tool, um, to try and help. So if you if you apply, uh, as Jamie said at the very, very first question, actually, if you apply your journey, follow your journey through your office, and at each point, think HATS, okay? So think hygiene. So at the entry door, um, at the lift, you think HATS, you think hygiene, you think um, atmosphere. Should people be going in there? How many people should go in there at the same time? You know what's going to be left in that lift by the time it gets up to the top and then who can enter so you might think okay well i'll tell you what's unacceptable i've only got a, a tiny little lift everybody uses the stairs so you 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 start to apply um the hats model uh, touch points you know how, how much are they are people going to touch a particular area and then potentially transfer and then how often am i going to have to clean that and um, to try and reduce the risk further and, and then the last one then is the social distancing. So applying hats at every part of that journey, the key parts of your of your office. So there's boardroom, there's um, there's a printer room, there's uh, sub offices, there's you know com call rooms potentially, there's the canteen. All of those apply hats, and it becomes a little bit easier then uh, once you get your head around how am I going to break this transmission. Because that's what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to follow a, a, a recipe. You're not going to try and follow a, a box that you're going to tick. You're actually in the business of trying to protect your staff um, that are coming to work. So, and this is where we can help. Okay, if anybody is struggling, we can help with that. Okay, and the, the final question that I've had in is with all the news headlines um, and the advice about working from home, and then it was encouraging people to go back into the office and now at the moment it's working from home again when people are being um you know told to go back into their offices can they feel safe can they feel safe going back into an office environment i i think so um and i think i I put one caveat on that is as long as we we're observing hands face and space if if we if everybody did that the 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 transmission rate of this our our own number as we call it our own north number would be greatly reduced and and what we're seeing is um we're seeing i don't know about anybody else on the call but it was very stressful going through lockdown very very stressful personally and then when you come out of that you go ah 
Okay. There's a bit, there was a sense of that. And, and I'm a scientist. <laughs> I normally deal in numbers, but there was a sense and a feeling of, uh, OK, we're, we're, we're kind of in the clear now. It's not as it's not as risky, but this thing isn't going away. Um, so you've, we've all seen the images of people in bars and, you know, not observing social distancing and, you know, it, it, with a few drinks on us, we, we get very relaxed. Um, but if we still apply this, the, you know, face covering, if we, if we apply our social distancing um, and we, we, we start to clean things, wash, washing our hands, if this, with this thing will be kept in check until a time comes when we actually have antivirals um, developed, which will be, it's looking like it's going to be into next year. So the question, to answer the question is, should you feel safe? Yes, the caveat being with, with those controls that are, are logically and risk-based put in place, I would absolutely feel safe going back to an office. Thank you. Right, well, those are all the questions we've had in now. Um, if anyone thinks of a question after this um, that they wish they'd asked, asked at the time, then please feel free to email me that um, question and um and we will respond to you within um within 48 hours with a with an answer for you um and just want to say thank you very much colm and jamie um for the webinar thank you everyone for attending and um and uh, we hope you found it useful absolutely and uh, yeah i would like to echo that katie thanks very much for everybody for taking the time out to to join us we do genuinely hope you felt this um helped um, we do like to um, we believe that we're helping to cut through this noise because uh, there is so much uh, bunkum out there. Um, uh, you know, you, we really do, uh, you know, I said it earlier on, the, 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 the scientific community um, is, is, is very solid. But there are four and a half thousand papers just suddenly published. Uh, it's, the, it's, been, it's been quite remarkable, the level of publications, but a lot of them aren't peer reviewed. So, you know, we have to put faith in our, in our public health professionals um, and mm -hmm. look at, you know, gov.co.uk. We have to um, adhere to that and, and take faith and trust in, in the messages that are coming out. And if everybody kept to this hands, face and space, we'd be in a much better place right now. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Cheers all.